This is a very nice turnout. We're so excited to welcome you to our event. Uh, we generally don't do events after Coachella because everyone's <laughs> mentally checked out, especially before finals, but I'm really grateful that you're here. I know it's a tough time of year, but this is gonna be very special. I'm grateful to our co-sponsors for helping make this event possible, especially the Thornton School of Music, Mindful USC, the Levin Institute for Humanities and Ethics, and the Office of Religious Life, and of course, very grateful to everyone who came out tonight. Today we're going to talk about two of my favorite things, mindfulness and music, and in so many ways I feel like both music and mindfulness saved my life and gave me new life. Music gave me a new way to see and hear the world, to participate in the stories and perspectives of others, and to experience awe, beauty, trance, and transcendence. And mindfulness taught me how to take a breath and be in the moment, how to let go of my negative, afflictive emotions, and how to find peace between my thoughts. At their core, both music and mindfulness have been spiritual practices for me. They've empowered me, I think, to cultivate a consciousness that is beyond words and beyond ego, to briefly reside in a place where time and space seem to stand still. And so I'm super excited today to be here at this event to think deeply about the convergence of mindfulness and music. It's appropriate that we're doing this conversation here at USC, which has the best music school in the world at the Thornton School, and the largest mindfulness initiative in American higher education, Mindful USC, which trains, if you count it all, but trains about 7,000 Trojans a year in mindfulness practices. And we're so lucky to have an extraordinary guide for this conversation, Richard Wolf, AKA Wolfie, your friend and mine, uh, as we celebrate the release of his amazing new book, In Tune, Music as the Bridge to Mindfulness. For those of you who don't know Wolfie, he is an, an Emmy Award winning composer, multi-platinum selling music producer, and an author. He's worked on projects with Prince, Belle Biv DeVoe. Does anyone know Belle Biv DeVoe? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Not that old. Uh, Freddie Mercury, my favorite, MC Light and Coolio, and he has been contributing to the soundtracks for hundreds of films and television episodes uh, worldwide, including 12 seasons of the hit NCIS. He is the CEO of the Producers Lab, a music publishing and production company which provides music for multiple networks and uh, platforms and studios, including Netflix, CBS, Discovery, and NBC. He is also a professor at the Thornton School across the street right here at USC. His class on the harmonies between music and mindfulness was the first at any university on a university level to explore how the two practices can interact and strengthen each other. And his book, which we're celebrating today, In Tune, Music as the Bridge to Mindfulness, contains techniques, keys, steps, commentaries that blend music and meditation together to help the reader begin or deepen a fruitful and impactful mindfulness practice. The format of the event will be as follows. We're gonna have a conversation. I'm gonna ask him a few questions up here. Then I'm gonna moderate a larger conversation with your questions. And then we're gonna um, have a little bit of a reception. The book is for sale. I encourage you to pick up a copy for yourself and your 12 best friends. It's really a great read. And Wolfie said he would stick around and personalize the books for you. So that's a great offer. Uh, please join me in giving a warm Trojan welcome to our friend, Richard Wolf. Thank you. All right. I loved what you said about the convergence of music and mindfulness. That's fantastic. Well, That's it's been my life and it's been your life. And I think those journeys bring us here in conversation today. This conversation with you and I started several years ago, actually. Yeah, yeah. In many ways, this is the culmination of many conversations and many different journeys we've taken. Yeah. So let's just start at the beginning. You're, you have this extraordinary career in music. Uh, tell us a little bit about your life in music and, and mindfulness. How did these two things come together for you? Um, well, I, 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 like you, I had to use mindfulness to save my life. Um, but that's a long story. I mean, I started with meditation when I was in high school. Um, I was a senior in high school, and uh, around the corner from where I lived was a zendo. And I was very enticed by the idea of reaching enlightenment, of course. You know, you, you're 17 years old, you want to reach enlightenment. So I went to the Zendo, and, and it was run by a, a very strict man from Japan, and, and it was dressed in black. And, you know, I'd go there, and he would teach us how to, how to meditate. The thing was that in those days, you couldn't uh, sit in a chair. So you had to sit in one of two positions, both of which involved torturous contortions on the floor for me anyway, because I'm not very flexible. So anyway, I sat there for a, a whole year, and all I could think of 
was how painful this is. And, uh, but I and continued in college. And the first year in college, I was meditating too, again with all the pain, and then I gave up on it. And uh, another time in my life, I wanted to take up meditation. I took it up with a crisis because it was a crisis in my life, about 1980. And I meditated for six months, but I couldn't keep it up. I was thinking, maybe you can meditate. Maybe you can sit and be undistracted by a crazy mind and crazy thoughts. But my mind is always racing. I can't do this. I'm not made up for this. So, you know, that was, that was it. And as you said, I, I, you know, went into seriously music and, and working in music. But then uh, something happened, which, which changed my life. And um, I, can we do a little thought experiment here? Sure, yeah. Okay, so imagine somebody on top of a very high ladder. As a matter of fact, imagine me on top of a very high ladder. Could be a little disconcerting, but. We can get you a ladder if you want a visual. <laughs> so I'm on top of this ladder and I'm trying to change a light bulb. It's very high. And all of a sudden my heart is trying to change its position in my body. And it starts to knock on the inside of my chest. And my wife is standing down and she's going, what's the matter with you? What's going on? I mean, you look like, you know, you're pale and something's going on with you. So I came off the ladder, I lie down on the bed, and my heart just continues to do its Muhammad Ali imitation, <laughs> boxing its way out of my chest. It says, let me out of here. I want to see the world. So my wife takes me uh, to the ER. And uh, I'm sitting in the, in, the, in the ear, I'm going, I'm going to die here, for sure, because my heart is just going nuts, and I'm, I'm going to die here, I'm finished. So uh, eventually they take me in, they do tests, 45 minutes go by, and then they say, you're fine, go home. I say, what do you mean I'm fine? What was that? They said, we don't know what that was, but you're fine, you're very healthy. So okay, I'm very healthy, I go home, and then I figure, you know what? I've been under a lot of pressure and anxiety. You talked about Prince and Freddie Mercury working in the, in the record business. I had decided I want to go into TV because that'll be less stressful. So I figured that'll be less, it turns out it's much more stressful. So I realized that I better do something about this anxiety because I don't know about you, but I don't want to ever have another panic attack. That's not something that I look forward to. So I decided I got to do something. So I went to, I hate to say this, UCLA because they're experts in panic. And I, I had the head panic person there, and he said, I'm going to prescribe you 10 minutes of meditation in the morning and 10 minutes of meditation at night. OK, I'm listening, I'm listening to this guy. I said, my whole life I've been trying to meditate. I haven't been able to do it. <laughs> now what's going to happen is I better do it, because I don't want another panic attack. So I, I start reading again. I had been reading all the time, but then I went back to it. And I read this book by an animal trainer, a Tibetan meditation master. And he said, you can train your wild mind like you train a wild animal. Now, I had heard similar things before, but then it made a special impression in me. Because I'm thinking, you know, I was born with zero talent as a piano player. No talent at all. But I practiced. And I it practiced, and I saw that if I practiced, I could play well enough to play on records. You know, we didn't have MIDI in those days, MIDI, uh, uh, you know, all that stuff. So I had to play on records, I practiced. So through practice, I saw that I could make advancement. And I'm thinking, if practice worked in this discipline of music, why wouldn't it work also in this other discipline of meditation? And sure enough, because of that connection, it worked. And then when I saw how there was this, this special relationship between practice here in music and practice over there in meditation, all these other correspondences, these bridges came to light. There was, I identify 12, all right? In the book I talk about the 12 bridges. There's probably more, there could be 17, I don't know, I like the number 12. Um, and, that's, and that's when it started and from then on, I just got deeper and deeper and deeper, and that's why I say it saved my life. Did you have panic attacks after that? No, no panic attack, no. But, you know, I, if I feel, by the way, you have anything for performance anxiety? Because right now, I'm... Um, <laughs> 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 
take a deep breath. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you recommended that, to take a breath. Yeah, okay. Um, where was I? Uh, I just asked you if you, 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 you panicked again. You didn't, and oh, that, no, that's why they call it practice, right? Okay, meditation because, practice. Yeah, yeah. It is we, about the practice. But the thing is, you see, you know when panic is coming. It's not that it's not going to come. Panic is coming, except now you know it's coming. It doesn't take you, it doesn't ambush you. So you say, okay, here comes panic. Okay, now what am I gonna do? Hello, panic, how you doing? You know what, I'm gonna take a deep breath. I'm gonna hold my breath, and you and I are friends. You know, we're friends, I'm okay with you. You wanna stick around, fine with me, because I'm not bothered by you. And that's, and that's what we do with panic, by the way. You, uh, you coined a term called the four musical horsemen of the apocalypse, and you say this is something that all professional musicians have to uh, sort of uh, in struggle with or transcend. What are those four musical horsemen and how can meditation or mindfulness be a potential remedy? Yeah, um, you know, you guys know uh, what happens. I mean, they just did a study in England, by the way, and they said that the rates of anxiety and depression among people in the music business in England are three times greater than the normal, the regular population. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why musicians are very vulnerable to this. I, I could just give you one simple thing. It's like Rick Rubin, said this, he said the musician, you know Rick Rubin, the producer, yeah, he's an amazing producer, a fantastic producer. He said, they asked him about why he meditates. And he said, you know, musicians are very sensitive people and we're different than most people and we feel that we don't fit in. So we feel pain, a lot of pain, just like everybody else does, but we're especially sensitive. And he said, you know, we live in a kill the pain society. You have pain, you drink alcohol, or you take opiates or whatever to kill the pain. He said through meditation, I tune into the pain. And that's how I deal with it. What are the anxiety? Okay, the four horsemen, yeah. yeah. The four horsemen in the musical apocalypse. So it's anxiety, depression, addiction, and suicide. And it's tragic because with suicide, we're losing, you know, the most successful, I mean, what killed me in, in the last year was Avicii. It says a 20 something year old guy, Avicii. I mean, the guy's making $20 million a year. He's going, you know, all he has to do is show his face and 10,000 people go nuts. And he takes, you know, he slits his wrists. You know, this is only, I, I don't know about any other field as bad as that, you know, and, and you know, there's example after Prince, Okay, why does Prince have to take opiates? What do you think? You know, uh, no, it's one after the other. So we have serious mental health and what mindfulness does and meditation does, of course, it changes your whole outlook on life. It's very transformative. And you get to deal with the pain in a different way. And you know, it's, a, it's, it's like a, a Swiss army knife of all these tools that you can use to deal with suffering. What, uh, a place where mindfulness and music converge is in getting past ego, getting past words, in losing yourself in some way or another. You can lose yourself in music, you can lose yourself in meditation. Talk about what that means, losing yourself within the context of music and meditation. And is, is that the same state? Are you doing the same thing with two different avenues or are they different experiences, whether you go through music or mindfulness? I, I love that. I love that whole question and that whole idea because Music, and music, you all know this, if you listen to music or if you make music, it's not about yourself anymore. First of all, it's a direct experience with sound. Usually, you know, when you're communicating with people, it's through the intermediary of your, the narrating voice in your mind is telling you what's going on. This is what's happening, whatever, never shuts up. It's, it's interpreting reality for you. Or you're talking with somebody else, it's, in, it's judging what they're saying and how you're gonna respond and all that. In music, you don't have that intermediary. It's a, it's a direct experience. And you also transcend the self. It's like uh, Eminem said, lose yourself in the music. You just get immersed. It's not about you anymore when you're making music. It's about the music. Bruce Springsteen said, when I perform music, I rise up and vanish into the music. He called it self-erasure and self-realization at the same time, which is what self-realization is. It's telling you 
that you're, you don't have a self. You have to find your true self. And Springsteen says it erases his self. Bob Dylan says, I don't write the song. The song writes me. And Keith Richards said, you don't play the riff. The riff plays you. So one musician after the other is saying, I'm not playing an instrument. It's not me that's doing this. I'm the instrument. A stronger, bigger force is expressing itself through me. Pharrell, Pharrell Williams, who did that uh, soundtrack for Hidden Figures about the space women, they asked him, where did, where did the soundtrack come from? Where, where did you get that idea? He said, I don't know, it's crazy. The universe took me by the hand and walked me. Now, we try to achieve that in meditative mindfulness. This is like the end goal, is the state of understanding maybe that it's not that yourself isn't real, but your idea of what yourself is, is incomplete, it's imperfect. You are actually the universe expressing itself in this time and place. And when you realize that, that transforms your whole outlook on the world and on your own suffering. You're not just confined in this bag of skin and everything outside is the other. That's one truth, but the opposite of one truth is another truth. And the other truth is that everything else in the universe is yourself. And so they, the problem with, with music is when the music stops, right, and you walk, it's a high, and, and you walk off the stage, it's a high because you, you're free from yourself. You walk off the stage and now you gotta live with yourself again. So through meditation and mindfulness, these musicians that have made it their practice, they learn, okay, this is how I'm gonna live with myself. I can be comfortable with myself this way because I realize that myself is everything. Miles Davis told you that learning about silence was the most important thing he learned as a musician. We know about silence in mindfulness. It's a necessary component to a practice. But what's the importance of silence in music? OK, um, yeah, Miles surprised me. I had lunch with Miles in 1985. I was friends with his producer. He said, you want to have, I was in New York. He said, you want to have lunch with Miles? I'm going, are you crazy, lunch with Miles Davis? So it's just the three of us, and we're the only ones in the restaurant. And he's in the back of the restaurant in this huge fur coat. It's the middle of the summer. And uh, anyway, he tells story after story, and I can't repeat any of the stories here because... We're on film. Yeah, you know, we're on film in a university, and I can't repeat it. But he stops telling these stories all of a sudden, and he turns to me and he says, you know what the most vital lesson I ever learned about music is? I said, no, Miles, well, what's that? He said, the importance of silence. Now, when he said that, I, it communicated, it connected to me, but I didn't understand what he was saying. I mean, I knew he had an album called In a Silent Way, which had a song on it in a silent way. He has a song on that album, shh. Well, what's Miles, what's Miles talking about? Well, eventually, I understood what he was talking about. Um, this is how important Musicians don't think about this, but baked into musical notation is the fact that sound and silence are given equal treatment. Whoever invented musical notation, we don't know who it is, when, it's been around, I mean, maybe uh, there's professors here that know when it was in invented, I don't know, but it's been around 400 years. For every notation of the duration of a sound, there's an equal notation for the duration of silence. You do not have a notation, play, in a, play in a tone without an equal notation for silence. That's how important it is. You have a whole note of tone, you have a whole note of silence. Quarter note, eighth note, 16th note, 32nd note, 64th note, hemi semi demi quaver, right? 64th note, 128th note, you know what it looks like, silence? It's a slanted like this with a bunch of circles. 128th note of silence. That's how important it is. So they're telling us mathematically, metaphysically, if you're gonna have sound, 
Silence has to get equal billing. Now, all the composers thought of that. And by the way, this is a global phenomenon, not just in the Western music. Because if you look at the Magian music, and Africa is part of that, they see silence as this vast ocean right, of space, and they pluck the music out of the silence. With their instruments, uh, you know, drums and the lyres and the lutes, they're plucking, they're inviting sound to come out of the silence. In the West, they saw the same thing. They saw the same vast ocean space of silence. But what do they want to do? What is the Western mind? Let's fill it up with sound. Let's fill it up. So what do they do? They invent the organ. That's a big instrument. Then they have the clavinet. But the clavinet doesn't fill up enough silence. So they get the piano. And that, that fills up the silence. So this is the problem. The problem is we got a lot of sound. We just need to balance it with silence. And there are musicians and this goes back further, but they're famous musicians like John Cage and Miles Davis and Paulino Oliveros, and now you have a whole movement called Wand uh, Wander Weisser, Michael Pizarro, he teaches here somewhere in university, and, and many composers that are working with the interplay to, they make actually guided nonverbal meditations to have you focus on the interaction between sound and silence that is always there when you're making music. You've uh, been teaching a class here at USC on mindfulness and music. What have your students learned in this class and what have you learned by teaching it? I, I hope my students learn something. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm always learning. I, I learn from them, from their practices, what's giving them problems, what they like about it. I mean, I love doing it. Um, what have they learned? I think they've learned, it's funny, I, it, they, they pick up on some stuff that's, that's unexpected from me. Like I had one student, she said, you said that when you learn how to listen mindfully, that you can not only hear what the other person is saying, but what the other person is not saying. And then she said, well, she had this fight with her boyfriend and her boyfriend, and she said, you're not saying X, Y, Z. You know. Um. I'm sure he appreciated uh, her being in your class. <laughs> yeah, very popular with him. I mean, that comes from Miles Davis uh, telling his band, uh, listen to the notes that aren't being played, you know. He told, he told Herbie Hancock. By the way, Herbie Hancock says, he's a professor. You know who Herbie Hancock is? That's right, the brilliant guy. On silence, he says, not only is silence as important as the surrounding notes, but it's a critical life skill. He told Herbie not to play the bottom notes. Herbie thought he said, don't play the butter notes. So he's trying to figure out what are the butter notes. So he just leaves out as many notes as he can. But that's, again, that's to hear what people aren't saying. What else do the students learn? I mean, they learn, you know, they learn certain things. Like one student uh, told me, uh, uh, you know, they were, I mean, caught in traffic. And they were about to, you know, get into an altercation. And then they thought about mindfulness and to say, okay, I'm frustrated. This is what I taught them. You know, you, 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 I'm frustrated. That's part of the human condition. Okay, I'm frustrated. All right, that's part of the you know, curricula vitae of being a human being. You get frustrated, that's all. You just, just say, I'm okay, I'm frustrated. So stuff like that, but they learn, uh, hopefully, how to practice, how to set aside time for, to practice, and the different techniques of practice, and they, and they find certain techniques that they like. You teach them meditation techniques? Yeah, yeah the, a repertoire. I believe in having a repertoire of different techniques. So maybe before we open it up for a larger conversation, uh, you could guide us in a maybe one minute, two minute meditation. Would that work? I don't. I don't do two you minute do meditations. Okay. No, I. I can't do it that fast. I All don't right. speed meditate. I, I, Let's go to questions and then we'll <laughs> revisit this at the end and we'll see how much time we have to actually lead into meditation. So. Uh, so let's open it up for questions for all of you. I might repeat your questions just for the sake of the camera. By the way, I don't know if this is good timing or not, but you referred to this at the beginning that we've been talking for two years or three years or whatever, a bunch of years. So you told me years ago, you said, if you ever finish your book and if you ever get it published, then we're going to do a book talk. And so that was in my mind the whole time. That Varun told me if I can finish this book, 
and I can find the publisher, and the publisher's gonna print it and put it out. Varun is gonna do a book. Tour. That's this, he's such an amazing guy. This is, you're such an amazing guy. The support that you've given me personally with the music and mindfulness and the whole mindfulness campaign, just unbelievable. Thank you, unbelievable. I appreciate that. Just like we rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so who's got a question for us, or a comment, or an observation, experience they'd like to share? I could keep asking questions all night. I got, yes? Um, so you say that mindfulness has changed your life, and you mentioned that it stopped panic attacks. In what other ways has it changed your life, or have you seen it change other people's lives? Oh, I think it's made me much calmer, um, more compassionate. Um, I mean, I just have going through, uh, you know, with my family, very difficult situations. And, uh, and if it wasn't for mindfulness, I wouldn't be here. If I didn't know how to cope with uh, a tremendous amounts of, of, of tension and stress and terrible things, I mean, I, there's no way I would be here. Leading with compassion and peace makes such a big difference. I mean, it's 180 degrees. What was the second part of your question? Oh yeah, that's to me right now from, from recent memory. That's the, the, but, but it changes everything. So you can deal with failure better, and you can deal with success better. You know, it, you manage your expectations, right? And that's really, really important. And as you know, you can't control everything. The only thing you can control is how you respond to things, and that takes a lot of training. When things happen like that, circumstances be able to have the serenity to say, I can't control this. I can control how to respond and calibrate what you think is you to try to be the best response. I'm curious, um, you had this journey um, discovering mindfulness through music. I'm curious, through that journey, has that reflected, uh, has your journey in mindfulness reflected back on the way you make music and how you approach music when you're composing or writing songs? Like, has that changed the way you approach things or anything? It probably does, but I can't put my finger on it, really. I think the biggest change is in how you live your life as a musician. So as a musician, you have to make all these choices and all these decisions. And for sure, the practice affects all of that. But when you're actually in the throes of the creative process, you're just, you know, you're just, a, a, you're just an instrument and you're just going with the music. So that's always been there. You don't need to practice mindfulness, as you know, to, to be a great musician. It, it helps, but you know, it's not necessary. It's, it's very, very good if you want to live your life as a musician. That's where it really and then it does have, you know, like you know, poor woman's anxiety, like you mentioned. It does have applications too in music. Yes. Um, you talked about how um, meditation has helped you cope with difficult problems that panic attacks. But when you don't have this, those problems, does meditation help you become a better person or a better, a higher state of mind, like what you dreamed of when you were 70 years old? Okay, that's that. You know, can I unpack that? Because to me, that has many levels in, in there. So, in the the level that the last level is, yes, meditation is a spectrum. It's a whole spectrum. You know, if you want to de-stress, if you want to handle anxiety and panic, if you want to handle depression, that's all there. But also in the spectrum is a full awakening, and that's definitely possible to see into ultimate reality. That's definitely there. And that, that's very transformative. That's part of the transformation. You don't have to get there, and you can do all the de-stressing and, and all of that. But it is a reality, and you do get there. The thing that you're, you said, if you're not stressed, Paul McCartney said, I wish young people could find a quiet haven in this not-so-quiet world. Because meditation is a gift, a lifelong gift. A gift you can call upon at any time. Memorize that because I love that. So what he's saying is that it doesn't matter, you don't have to be stressed or whatever. This is a gift and every time you sit down to meditate, you're building up this gift that's gonna last your whole life in all these different situations. So you don't have to be stressed out to do it. You follow what I'm saying? 
Great question, yes. A couple of times. Um, Pauline Oliveros is uh, a composer. She died last year or the year before. In the last two years, she passed away. Um, I she was a real trailblazer, a, a gay woman in this field. And she had a, an institute, a Rensselaer Institute, called the Deep Listening Institute. And she created these compositions that asked the audience to listen to sounds and then sing what they hear and to use meditation as part of the composition. So, and she's got all these, she has a book and she, and she has all these directions on how to use uh, listening to the soundscape as a composition. And then what I go into, what I go into is uh, a little different, but when you're sitting meditating to hear tones, and so you're kind of, kind of composing your inner music at the same time as you're composing yourself. Right, it, it, yes, but it's in your inner music that you're hearing. You're hearing your inner voice express tones along with your breathing. It's all one thing going on. So you're actually composing yourself and you're composing, you're improvising music. Um, and it starts, actually, it all started with John Cage, four minutes and 33 seconds, you know, where, where, where the audience comes in expecting to hear music and the, the, the orchestra's on stage and they don't play. I mean, that was genius. And by the way, it's no accident that he was a Zen Buddhist. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, what do you see, like, the landscape of, like, mindfulness, like, how, like, the future of mindfulness? So I really like the USC mindfulness app here, but do you see yourself, you know, kind of putting mindfulness on the forefront just generally in the mainstream in terms of, like, having your own app or anything besides the book? Like, are you going to, what, what, like, in terms of, like, how is, do you think mindfulness will be more and more common, like, in the future? Maybe I can add something. And will music be more and more a part of the introduction of mindfulness into mainstream culture? Well, um, I think music, people associate uh, in, in a lot of ways meditation and music together, right? Um, I don't know. I think it, mindfulness seems to be a growing uh, awareness about culture in general. Hopefully it continues, I think it will. It seems to because our classes are filling up fast and you've got 7,500, so the younger generation. I think Varun once asked me about working with musicians that practice mindfulness. And years ago, there, was a, there were very few, hardly any. Nowadays, the younger generation coming up, they're more and more doing, you know, aware of this. So I think that's inevitable. As far as what I'm concerned with is the four horsemen of the musical apocalypse and bringing mindfulness to the music community to help us uh, ward off the plagues of these four horsemen of the apocalypse. I didn't recognize you because you got the yeah, look yeah. Yeah. Kind of, <laughs> a mustache and this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. well, all I was going to say was like it's, it's probably one of. And I'm, I'm saying, like, where's it going to go? Because I think it's extremely important. I think everyone can benefit from it in some some way. It may not be for everyone, but I think it's, it's it doesn't hurt to try. So, congratulations on your last class. That was awesome. And um, let me just ask you a quick question. So you said it's one of the best things you learned here. What, what was the practice, the convergence, the interplay? I think, like, the, the revelation that um, you are nothing and you are a bit more practical, what I'm saying is like, once you realize that you're just like a small dog in this like entire universe, you just become that much more happier because all the moments that you have nearby, near you, near strangers, or your family, you just appreciate every second more because, like you said, this is just a vessel, this is the body. And so once you realize like all these things that may not, you know, come to your place that are negative, 
that just happens. Like, you, you know, it's, it's whatever. It happens to everybody. But the way you react is like the biggest thing. And I feel like the biggest takeaway that I got from that class is my reaction and being like analytical. It's like, I don't have to, like, I might have physically have an emotional reaction, but I don't have to suffer. I don't have to, like, be angry. I don't have to cut someone off. I don't have to take it out on the loved ones. Because I feel like that's very common. You're not your thoughts, you're not your emotions. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Were, were you the traffic guy? Like, no, yeah. but actually, <laughs> you're the traffic guy. <laughs> Very good student. Yeah. Yeah. Ask him the question about what the students learn. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. All right. Got a couple other questions. Um, you know, like you mentioned, that we're going to a new instrument that can bring new types of music. I guess. Um, I was just curious if you had any thoughts on, um, like, you know, artificial intelligence and stuff like that starting to create music, and we're going off in space, which maybe we'll hear this. Do you think any of that might? You know, do you have any thoughts on how that would change music? And secondly, separately, do you think um, music could be used in a different way to basically improve the politics and peace and the, at the political level? Some big questions. <laughs> the future of music and can music solve our crises? Well, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, it's been, it wouldn't be the first time that music is used in politics. I mean, it was very big in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and the anti-nuclear movement. I don't know if you saw the movie about Freddie Mercury and Queen, uh, Live Aid, but uh, they're raising money. Uh, so, you know, musicians, I think musicians like Kendrick Lamar, um, I think he might be having an effect on people. Uh, by the way, Ken, I don't know if you follow Kendrick Lamar, but um, I think it has an effect when he says in his songs, meditation is a must, it don't hurt if you try. So you're thinking too much, plus you're too full of yourself. Worried about your career? What about your health? That's Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> so I think when he comes out with stuff like that, people are listening. I mean, he won a Pulitzer Prize. But in people in his neighborhood and people that he talks to, he, he's having an effect. J. Cole also talks about meditation. Um, I think these musicians have a lot of uh, sway with their listeners, and I think that has an effect. Bob Marley, by the way, he's the expert of Bob Marley. Bob Marley had a big political effect on people, too. And, you know, so, so that would happen as far as AI is concerned. I mean, there's a lot going on with AI, and I know they're in music now, they're, they're integrating AI in certain projects, and they will have success in certain areas, but I'm, you know, I, I think there's nothing that's gonna really replace. I mean, can you imagine AI coming up with Kendrick Lamar, uh, Kendrick Lamar or something like that? I mean, I don't see that, uh, and I think people will, the human ear is always attuning to the human voice. That's when you hear a record, the first, what you're really listening to is the human voice, unless you're a drummer and you're focusing, but, the normal person, it's the, it's the human voice. So if you, have a, if you have a human voice versus a robot, we're still human and we're gonna seek out the human voice. I uh, have a four-year-old daughter and I've raised her entirely on Bob Marley. So literally she was born to Bob Marley, the Rainbow Theater concert from 77 in London. She was born to that sound, to that concert. And yet she comes home from her LA preschool singing Cardi B all the time. And she knows like all the lyrics to all the songs. I'm like, how, how do you know this? And why do you know this? And why do you love her so much? Because she loves Cardi. And she said to me the other day, she says, Papa, I love her because she's not afraid to be herself. I'm like, wow, that's pretty astute for a four-year-old. It's probably right on, but like, how did you come up with that? So we do our best, I think, you know? And uh, she has her own sort of path ahead of her. And the other day she said to me, you know Justin Bieber is better than Bob Marley. You know that, right? And she's like taunting me now. It's taunting me. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Off on a tangent. I'm going to take uh, the last question here because I have the uh, moderator prerogative. Uh, students come up to me all the time and ask me a question, and I'm wondering what you would say to them if they asked you this question. They're often artists or musicians, and they say, I, they say my creativity comes from sort of my energy and my even to, from my anxiety, it 
comes from the way I act and move in the world. And when I meditate, I feel disassociated with those things. And therefore, I think it's going to have a negative impact on my creativity and my art, because my art is a reflection of that. What would you say to them? And what is the relationship between mindfulness and creativity in your experience? Well, I think there's two separate questions. Because there's a whole thing about how mindfulness can help creativity. And I've seen it in people and they've told me about it. And so we can get into that. And then there's the flip side that people always say that a lot of musicians say, well, I'm running out of my pain and my suffering. So if I'm not going to suffer anymore, I'm not going to have anything to write about. OK, show me somebody who doesn't have anything to suffer about. I mean, every, you know, it doesn't mean you're not going to stop suffering totally. It doesn't mean you're going to stop feeling suffering for other people. You're going to see plenty of suffering in the world. There's plenty to write about. I mean, I don't think there's any shortage of pain. And I've never met anybody who said, oh, I'm, yeah, I, I have no more pain. <laughs> I'm just perfect. It's just, I'm, I mean, a person like that was not going to care about writing music or anything like that, to, you know. Um, do you think Beethoven, who, when he wrote Ode to Joy, what was that about? I mean, you can, you can feel joy and, and, and uh, ain't nothing but a G thing. You know, it was a good day. I didn't even have to use my AK, as Ice Cube said. I mean, come on, there's plenty of, to write about besides, you know, I'm hurting in here. It's uh, this pain in here, ain't it clear? Okay, but to answer your question, so. I just want to acknowledge that transition from Beethoven to Ice Cube. It was smooth, <laughs> <laughs> totally organic, and absolutely on point. I mean, the whole world loves Ode to Joy. I mean, he was happy when he wrote that, you know? Um, mindful creativity. So there's two things where mindfulness helps in, in creativity. So David Lynch wrote this book. I don't know if you, you, you know David Lynch, the director, about his meditation practice. And um, he says that negativity is the enemy of creativity. So I'll give you an example. You all know this, if you're writers or creators or musicians, you, you've all been through this. You have like a little critic on your shoulder, and you're writing, and the little critic is telling you, that's no good, do something else, See, do something else. And you're happy with it, and you're fine with it. And then the critic goes, that's no good, you gotta change, that's no good. And the critic never shuts up. You know, I actually had a, a colleague of mine, and he, he was a very successful composer for television, but this critic never shut up, and he couldn't write anymore. This is a typical problem with having this idea of perfection that artists have. You know, Leonardo, it's like Leonardo da Vinci said, I never complete a work of art, I just abandon it. And in mindfulness, you learn how to just let go. You learn, you let go. At some point, you just gotta let go, and you practice letting go, because you're letting go of your plans, you're letting go of your regrets about the past, and your anticipation of the future, you learn how to let go. So when you're creating, you have to learn at some point, you have to learn how to let go. And that's very helpful. And it also quiets the negativity. Now, David Lynch says, he says, that because meditation gives you more consciousness, if you have more consciousness, therefore you have more raw material to work with, more energy to create. That's his theory. I don't know if it's true or not, I think it's a very interesting theory. It works for him and apparently other people. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Um, we're going to stick around, and uh, Wolfie's going to sign books. So please purchase a book, have something to eat, hang out, and continue the conversation. And please join me in giving a great big shout out and thank you to our friend Richard Wolf. Thank you, thank you so much. We really appreciate this. And we did it. We had a post coach on the So we proved the concept. So thanks to all of you. Good luck with finals. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.